Remember this patient from module number 11. As the clinician continuing to care for this patient, you have additional thoughts and considerations. Is he at risk for coronary artery disease? What is its occurrence and distribution in the population to which he belongs? If coronary artery disease is found, will the condition shorten his life? Will reduction of his risk factors, i.e. from cigarette smoking or hypertension, improve his outlook? Clinicians also need the answers to these kinds of questions in order to make the best possible medical decisions for their patients. Epidemiology is usually defined as the study of factors that determine the occurrence and distribution of a disease in a population. There are two important words that are used to describe how much of a specific disease exists. The first is incidence, the frequency of the occurrence of the disease, the number of new cases of the disease over the course of a study. The second is prevalence, which is the number of people who have the disease over a given period or interval of time or at a given point in time. Prevalence equals incidence times the average duration of the disease. Over the course of a study, each new case or incident goes into the prevalence pot. Each case in the pot can do one of two things. It can remain in the pot for the duration of the study, or it can come out of the pot, either because the person dies or because they recover from the disease. The rain coming into the puddle and the water evaporating from the puddle are another way to think about incidence and prevalence. An individual can represent an incident only once, but can be a prevalent case at a number of points in time. For example, case number three is a prevalent case both at mid-year, where the vertical line is, and at the end of the study on December 31st. Case number five is only a prevalent case at the end of the study. Incident rates and prevalence rates are both measures of morbidity. A number of factors contribute to specific diseases having high or low prevalence. Here's an example of diabetes prevalence and another of HIV prevalence. Here you can see that the prevalence of AIDS increased steeply from 1981 to 1990. This was mostly due to new incidents. After 1990, the prevalence, while much higher than in 1981, levels off. The sharp rise is not continuing. That's not because the number of new cases level off. They do not. They continue to rise sharply. However, the number of people dying from AIDS begins to decrease. Therefore, the prevalence levels off. Certain events or factors put people at risk for the disease of interest over the course of a study. Attributable risk is the additional incidence above baseline that is caused by the risk factor or event. The absolute risk of getting a disease is equivalent to the incidence of the disease. While this makes sense, it is not always the most useful concept. Often what we want to know is what the relative risk of a person or a group getting the disease is. That is, is there something about a particular group or this situation that puts them at relatively greater risk than other persons are at? One example of relative risk factor is age. You might want to know what the relative risk of disease incidence is in people over 75 years compared to that in people under 45 years of age. You might want to also calculate the relative risk ratio for the incidence of broken legs in people who ski compared to those who do not. I'll bet you can think of a lot of relative risk factors. To find relative risk, we start looking at the incidence of the disease in the present and wait for time to pass. We look at one group that naturally lives with the risk factor and one that does not, and ask which group has more people who develop the disease over the course of the study. This is called a prospective approach to studying the role of risk. We are asking what happens going forward from the present time. In class, we will calculate absolute risk reduction and relative risk reduction. Take a look at the results of the study described by Glazer. During the study, 73 of the 3,293 men in the placebo group died from a cardiovascular event, and 50 of the 3,302 men in the Pravastatin group died. Thus, 2.2% of the men in the placebo group died, and 1.5% of the men in the Pravastatin treatment group died of a cardiovascular event. The relative risk of death was then 1.5 divided by 2.2, which equals 0.68. Therefore, the relative risk reduction was 1 minus 0.68, which equals 0.32, or 32%. That's a pretty big number. It looks as if the Pravastatin really lowers the risk of death. Absolute risk reduction is the difference between the absolute risk rate of the placebo and the drug groups. Here, that would be 2.2% minus 1.5%, which equals 0.7%. So the absolute risk reduction is pretty small.
Given the numbers from this study, which do you think better reflects reality, relative risk reduction or absolute risk reduction? Absolute risk reduction also allows you to calculate a statistic called numbers needed to treat, NNT. NNT equals 100 divided by absolute risk reduction. Here, that is 100 divided by 0 0.7, which equals 143. The 143 represents the number of people you would need to treat to save one life. What if the NNT were a million? What if it was three? How would you think differently about it? In a case control study, a group of people who already have the disease and a controlled disease-free group are identified, and we look back to see how many people in each group had been exposed to the risk factor for the disease in the past. Therefore, case control studies are retrospective studies because we're looking back from the present. When retrospective studies are conducted, odds rates ratios are calculated. An odds ratio is the odds that a person with the disease or a case was exposed to the risk factor divided by the odds that a person without the disease or the control was exposed to the risk factor. Obviously, if this ratio equals 1, then the odds that the two groups were exposed to the risk factor is equivalent. To calculate an odds ratio, we first need to understand what odds are. Odds equals the probability of an event occurring divided by the probability of the event not occurring. With a six faith die, the probability of tossing a six is one divided by six, which is 0 0.167. The probability of not tossing a six is five divided by six, which is 0 0.833. Therefore, the odds of tossing a six are 0 0.167 divided by 0 0.833, which equals 20%. So, an odds ratio is a ratio of two odds, and odds are ratios of two probabilities. Therefore, we need to calculate four probabilities to get the two odds that make up the numerator and denominator of the odds ratio. Let's look at a two-by-two two table to see where the numbers for these ratios come from. In the matrix, we see that 176 people with the disease, asthma, were exposed to the risk factor, mold and 108 people without asthma were exposed to mold. We also see that 98 people with asthma were not exposed to mold, while 211 people without asthma were not exposed to mold. Below the tables, you can see the two probabilities to calculate the odds of the disease in the risk group, as well as the two probabilities to calculate the odds of the disease in the no risk group. Given the two odds that we just calculated, the odds ratio for this matrix is 3.5. Now, believe it or not, all of this is the same as A times D divided by B times C, as you can see in the equation below the matrix. What does this mean, however? It means that people with asthma were 3.5 times more likely to have been exposed to mold in the past than those without asthma. Rather than looking at the risk for a disease, we can also look at the rate of a disease. The rate is the number of people who get the disease during a given interval divided by the number of people who are at risk for the disease during that interval times a constant. Sometimes it's more informative to use rate than risk when examining a disease. In this figure, the percentage of people surviving at any given time is plotted against time. Over the year, the risk of death was 10% in all three populations, but if you wanted to know about survival at mid-year, you would see that the rate of death, which is calculated using the percentage of deaths at that time as the denominator, would be the highest in population A and the lowest in population B. We use something called confidence intervals to assess whether a risk ratio or an odds ratio differs significantly from one. In class, we will use confidence intervals to determine whether specific risk and odds ratios are significantly different from one. Hazard ratios are ratios of rates. They can be hazard rates, cure rates, or survival rates. To construct a Kaplan-Meier curve from survival data, you place time on the x-axis and the percentage of people who are progression-free and surviving on the y-axis. You can imagine two curves on this plot, one for a treatment group and one for a control group. This would help you see the difference in survival rates between the two groups.